Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. In this message, Jeremy reminds us that as Christians, we are called to make disciples. And as parents, the most important disciples we will ever make will be our own children. If you have any questions about Crosswind Church, please don't hesitate to check out our webpage, www.crosswindchurch.net, or email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. Uh, Ernie came up and talked to me just a minute ago. Ernie and Frieda, where are you guys real quick? Just raise your hand real quick. Ernie and Frieda, where are you? Over here. Been married 41 years today, right? I was, at, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that. Yeah, that's a long time. I was thinking about being married 41 years as, as you guys, as, as you came up and me up. You guys have taken some family photos, haven't you, over the years? There have been some. Yeah. Now, do you have, let me ask you this one more question. Do you have the wall in your house that's dedicated to pictures? Like, the just family pictures? Yeah. Growing up, growing up, I remember my grandparents had that same kind of wall. In fact, they had a den uh, and, and, and it had a green couch in front of it. And above that was uh, a wall that was just of pictures. And as a little boy, I can remember going and looking at that wall of pictures. It was pictures of, like, important things, you know, like when my grandpa got out of the Navy. There were pictures there on the wall, and uh, like my parent, my mom, her, her prom photos were up there, my aunt's prom photos, and my first baby photo um, up there was up there, you know, and those sorts of things. But my favorite pictures to look at were the um, uh, family portraits. You, you guys remember family portraits? Let me tell you how that happened in my family, family portraits, because maybe your story is similar to mine. Family portraits happen one of two ways. Typically, it happened this way, where the pastor would get up on Sunday morning and go, it's time to do a church directory, and we need you to go take a church photo of your family. And if you don't know what church directories are, if you're not familiar with church directories or, or, or things like that, church directories are essentially yearbooks, but for church. And when we get them, we, um, we are upset about the new members that have come since the directory has been put out that aren't in the directory, and we lament and cry about those that were in the directory that are no longer at our church. That's what it's for. So you get them, and then you're unhappy with them. I don't, I don't understand it. They're like your books for the church. And so what you do is you go down to some studio, or you go up to the church, and they take your picture, and then somebody convinces you to spend a lot more money than you really ought to on some photos, and one of them ends up on a picture frame on the wall of pictures in your house. The other way that it kind of happens is someone in your family, and in my case it was always the matriarch of the family, like my mom, my grandmother, they would kind of go, it's time to take a family picture. We're going to go take a family picture, and we would call and make an appointment at Owen Mills, right? Did y'all do Owen Mills photos? Yes. <clears throat> it was always weird for me going to Owen Mills when I was a little boy because the Owen Mills, I promise you, I'm not making this up, was actually in a hotel room in the local Holiday Inn. And so, like, it always felt a little sketchy to me, right? Like, you walk in, and there's a dude there with backdrops and cameras, like, come on in, you're going to take a picture, right? It always felt a little weird. I, don't, I wish I could remember. I don't remember. Did, were there beds in there? I don't remember. Do we sit on beds while we're waiting? Like, that's a little awkward, a little sketchy. But, but we would always go and take these family photos. And inevitably, you can't just go take family photos, right? No, no, no. You have to plan for it. You have to wear at least complimentary colors every now and then. Some mom or some dad will go, we're not just going to wear complimentary colors. We're going to wear the exact same thing when we go to get our family photos. Maybe your family photo looks a little bit something like this. Do we have a picture? Oh, please. Okay. We don't have a picture that ruins it. Oh, yeah. Like that. <laughs> Tell me this is, I hope I don't come up with any of your family photos either. Okay? You wear exactly the same thing. Or, or maybe, I, I have daughters, so I hope that this will happen one day where Jody says, not only am I going to wear exactly the same thing my daughter's going to wear, we're going to do our hair exactly the same way, and you get this. And this is like what I think, this is what happens when you go, this is the way I was when I was 15 and what I'm going to look at when I'm, when I'm older than that. I don't know, let's move on. And the dad there, he's just like, yeah. It, good thing they have a bunch of hair because he didn't have any, right? And then I can remember one time we went to a place, me and Jody went to a place called Portrait Innovations, which is like uh, Owen Mills, but you get your pictures that day. And so it's like, it's like Owen Mills for people like me because I don't have to wait for anything to come back. And, um, and so we go, and, and I remember they, they had these cool little backdrops that they dropped back. And for us, they had, they had like a, a wooded backdrop, and then they put out a picnic blanket and a picnic basket, and they made Jody and I kind of lay down, and the girls like get on our backs. And I'm like, this is just weird. It could have been this, though. Like, this could have been a lot worse. I, who thinks this is a good idea when it comes to their family photo? I, 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 don't, I don't quite get that. 
Um, and, and, and then, you know, you, there could be some other cool little things that you have with your family photos. Show me the next one. Please. There we go. This is where, this is where that family member, because we all have that family member, goes, look, I'm going to buy everybody the same thing for Christmas. Maybe it's a sweater with their initial on it or whatever. It's like you know, our favorite college sweatshirt or whatever. This guy went to the next level and said, I'm going to buy you astronaut suits, and we're all going to go take pictures, and that's one they can't ever get back. There's, there's, a, there's one last photo I want to show you guys uh, before I move on to some serious stuff. Uh, can you show that one to me real quick? Yeah, this is those ones. It's my favorite now. <laughs> My favorite photos now are the ones that aren't necessarily professionally done, but it's like you go to the beach, and when you go to the beach, you have to take these family photos, and you do that one that's real popular with high school girls where you hold hands, you all jump at the same time, right? Be careful with that, because that can, that's where that can lead, and they're all happy and about to not be. There's one last photo that I want to share with you guys. I want to show you guys. This is this one's a serious one. Show this one. It doesn't work without this photo. All of it falls apart. I don't have five, Jeremy. Uh, it, says, it says Jeremy's first family photo. Well, let me describe it to you. I was an adorably cute, blonde, little girl, a fat little boy, little girl. I was a little girl. I looked like Abby, actually. Uh, I looked like Abby uh, just a little bit. Jeff, it is on the desktop as well if you want to try to, try to pull it back onto that. And I wanted to show you this picture for a very particular reason. It was a church directory picture. Um, as many of our family photos were. But my very first family photo involved myself and my grandparents. My, my grandpa, who died in 2008, and my grandmother, who I called my mom. By the way, does anybody call their grandmother something a little bit weird? Own that stuff, right? Like, I was so embarrassed by that, I called her my mom, and I was kind of ashamed and that sort of thing. But no, own it. That's who she is. She's my mom, and so is my grandpa and my mom. And then my mom... And her two sisters, my Aunt Dee and my Aunt Sandra, were all in this picture. That was my first family photo that I can remember. And I was really cute. I wish you could have seen that, right? I actually looked like I was out of the movie The Shining. It doesn't look like that. <clears throat> but I tell you that story and I show you that because I want you to understand something about me. My mom was 19 years old when she gave birth to me. And my biological father actually uh, married her and divorced her before I was ever even born. And so he was not a part of my life. At all, and for the first four years of my life, the first four years of my life, I lived with my grandparents and my aunts, and I was kind of raised in that type of environment. And I can tell you all about how my dad adopted me and all the wonderful things that came out of that, and a number of things that come out of that. But I want you to understand something. If I were to go around the room and the statistics were to hold true, and I guarantee you that they probably would hold true in this room, as well as they would in any other room across the United States, many of you all could share a very similar story, right? You had step parents or step brothers or step sisters or half brothers or half sisters. You were raised by grandparents or you were uh, raising your grandchildren or you knew somebody close to you that was. You had a cousin that lived with you for a little while. All of us kind of have those stories. I came across some statistics, which is difficult to say. I came across some of these numbers that kind of kind of pointed that out. There it is. Look how adorable that guy is. And you can leave that up there just a minute because I want him to look. Anyway. <clears throat> came across some statistics, some statistics. 500,000 at least individuals this year will become step parents. One out of every three children that are born are born to single parents. And less than 50% of the children that are in our schools today do not go home to a, to a, to a home where both mom and dad live. It's kind of interesting. Last night I was going over those numbers with my wife as a school teacher. You just ask any school teacher and she'll tell you. And I said, Jody, is that number true? It's 50% of kids. And she went, I said, I'm surprised it's that high. We live in a world, watch, where the nuclear family, where mom and dad and their children living together in one room, exists less than it does exist. We live in a world where we all kind of have some kind of blend in our family, some kind of mix in our family, some kind of somebody absent in our family. That's kind of the world that we live in. And I'm a part of that, and you're a part of that. Hardly anyone is exempt from that. The problem is, the problem is, is that for centuries and for millennia, the family has been the basic building block of society. The family has been kind of the, the, the blocks on which all of society has been built. It was where 
the children were taught about morality and ethics. They were taught about how to get along with one another. And they were taught about how to solve problems and solve conflict. And, and, and we can just even go all the way back. Let's talk about just the two cultures or two of the cultures that we read about in the Bible. The Old Testament, the Hebrew people had a society that was completely based around a nuclear family. In fact, when they gave away the land in the promised land that God had given to the people of Israel... He gave them land based on what family they were a part of. Based on what lineage they came from. Their family was that important. When you move into New Testament times, you see Greek culture permeate all of the known world. What we see at that point is every family had a pater familia in Latin, or a father of the family, or a head of the house. And as he went, everyone else in the house went. In fact, even if you were a son... <coughs> You found yourself under his authority. And when you would go get married, it was not uncommon for you to come and just build a room onto your father's house where you and your bride then would come and be a part of what it was that was going on where his father was. Even when our country was founded, we had family units that came and settled land and homesteaded land and began to work together and serve together and worship together. Now, I could stand here today and we could talk about the breakdown of the family and the, the breakdown of society, and I think that that's true. But I think that one of the things that kind of came as a byproduct of the breakdown of the family that's causing massive problems, not just in society, but especially even in the church, is this. Because of all the chaos that ensues and because of all the problems that come from, from situations and the, as a family unit breaks down, because of all of that, what happens in a lot of cases, not every case, but in a lot of cases, is that parents then abdicate the responsibility of educating their children to other people. Meaning they give up that responsibility to other people. Meaning that I'm not, I don't have time to deal with teaching my children about certain things, so I'm going to pass that bug of responsibility on to someone else to let them do it. You want to know how I know that this has occurred in today's society? It's because I do premarital counseling. And I promise you, I get to sit down with every couple that I ever marry, and, and I tell them, here's the deal. Before I'll marry you, you have to go through premarital counseling. I don't have to do it, but somebody has to do it. If you want me to do your wedding, that's awesome. I'll do it. But we're going to sit down for at least four sessions, and we're going to try to work out a lot of the problems before you get married. Because it's a lot easier to work them out before you get married than it is after you get married. After you get married. Can I get an amen for that? All right, so what I do is I sit down, and over time, here's what I find out. I find out parents do a lousy job of teaching your kids how to have relationships. You do. You, we, we don't teach them how to communicate. We don't teach them how to solve problems, right? We don't teach them how to, how to work through difficult situations. We just kind of typically do a pretty lousy job of that. In fact, it's kind of funny. I do an entire session on the word that starts with S and ends with X. It doesn't come between five and seven, Right? Okay, you go over here. Sex. We do a whole session where we talk about sex. <clears throat> right? And I ask a question to these, to these kids that are getting married. I go, listen, let me ask you a question. Tell me, what did your parents teach you about sex? And almost 100% of the time, I'm not making this up, here's what I get. They taught me nothing. They asked me the night before I got married if I had any questions. Or they gave me a book. That's what I get. Let me tell you what that says to me. It says that as parents, we've taken a responsibility that is ours to educate our children, and we've passed that book of responsibility on to someone else. Because if we don't teach our children how to live in society, someone else will. The question is, are they going to teach them the same things that we want to teach them? See, here's, here's another little truth, and we'll move on to the Bible, I promise. Parents, especially grandparents, you get this. You are in the habit, parents, you are in the business of creating little yous. You understand that? You know that thing that your mama said to you? One day, I hope that you grow up and have a kid that's exactly like you. I want you to know that stuff works. Right? How many of you have said something, got the words come out of your mouth, and before you can grab them and shove them back in, you're like, man, my dad used to say that. My mom used to say that. Listen, 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 listen. You're creating little miniature yous. Your kids are watching you, learning from you, and becoming just like you. They're going to take what is bad of you and magnify it. They're going to take what is good of you and magnify it. And if we as parents abdicate the responsibility of teaching our children to someone else, if we hand that over to someone else, then we 
basically shun our influence in their lives for the 936 weeks that we have from the time they're born to the time they graduate high school. We just give over that responsibility. The thing is, taking responsibility for instructing your kids, it's not anything that's new. It's something that was taught thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And so today what I'm going to do is I want to read a passage of Scripture from the book of Deuteronomy. Way early in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And I want to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. This is one of the most famous passages of Scripture in the Old Testament, especially if you are a Hebrew. It was one that you would have memorized. It was one that you have known. You would have probably had it written down on little small pieces of paper and nailed to your doorpost and put on your forehead, especially if you were an Orthodox Jew along the way. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, let me read a little bit to this, a little bit of this. And if you're new here, what I'm going to do is read a little bit and talk a little bit, read a little bit and talk a little bit as we work our way through this. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now Moses is talking here, and what he's doing is he is nearing the end of his life, and he is going to begin presenting the law to the people of Israel a second time. In fact, you didn't know this, but Deuteronomy, Deutero, means second. Nami comes from the word for law. It's a second giving of the law. How about that? That's free information. That wasn't even part of my message, okay? Deuteronomy, a second giving of the law. And so as he is getting ready to do this, he stands up in front of the people of Israel, and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Hebrew word Shema, which is where this passage gets its name from. If you ever hear anybody talk about the Shema or the Shema, it's, I think it's pronounced Shema, but you can do it that way. Anyway, he says, here's what I need you to know. First and foremost, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. What this does is it separates the God that the Israelites worship from the gods that all of the other people around them worship. This is not a pantheon of gods. This is not a multiplicity of gods. This is one God. The Lord we serve is one God. Verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now we have trouble with this little word love here today. You're going to hear me say this as long as I'm your pastor. Our society views the word love as a noun, something that you fall you know, into like a swimming pool and out of like a third-story window, right? But it is not a noun when we start talking about biblical love. The love that the Bible refers to is a verb. It's an action word. And so when we're instructed to love God with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength, we're instructed to be radically committed, radical, because the world doesn't understand it, doesn't make sense to them, right? Radically committed because it's not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Let me say it again. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. It's a radical commitment to the advancement, the building up, the well-being of the other person. That's the love that Christ showed to us. And that's the love now that we're supposed to reflect back to our Heavenly Father. Here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God. This is so important that Jesus, a couple thousand years later... He would reiterate this in Matthew chapter 22. One of the teachers of the law would come to him and say, Master, what's the greatest commandment in all the law? And you know what Jesus would say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, all the law and the prophet hangs. He would go, this is it. If you want to understand what I want you to do, it's love, love, love. That's it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. With everything that you have, in other words, be committed to God and love Him. Look what he says next, because I think this kind of reiterates it. Verse 6, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Let me, let me see if we can kind of wrap our heads around this. Basically saying, I'm getting ready to give you a second giving of the law. You're going to re go over this with you. I'm going to teach it to you again because we're repetitious type of people. We like to repeat things. And so because of that, we're going to go over it again. And I want these words, these commandments I give you to be written on your heart because I want them to be exactly what directs you. I want them to be what motivates you. I want it to be the factor by which you judge your life and guide your life. Now, let's just talk about it for a minute. Go think back with me, if you will. Those of you that have ever been in love, maybe it's with your spouse. Maybe it was another story. Right? But, uh, you, know, you, know, you get that Twitter page feeling you know what I'm talking about? That Twitter page feel, feel where you get the butterflies in your tummy every time you're around your knees get weak and want to throw up. You know what I'm talking about? Can I just take some watch, watch, watch? I hope you still feel that with your spouse um, some days. But anyway, what, what would you do when you felt that? Well, you would do anything, wouldn't you? Come on, you'd spend every last dime you had. 
You'd spend all night on the phone going, you hang up, though, you hang up, though, you hang up, though, you hang up, though. Right? You would drive hours and hours and hours just to see her face, just to see her, his face, right? You would, you would do things that were insane, that didn't make sense. It would literally guide your thoughts. I remember before when Jody and I were, were uh, engaged and I was at Vanderbilt. She was down in Birmingham. And, and uh, uh, this was before instant messaging, before text messaging. I know I'm old. This was like email was about as fast as we could possibly get. And I don't think people do email anymore. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, regardless, so I, was sit, I would go to the library at Vanderbilt, the medical, the medical library there, and I would sit, and I would email her, and then I'd hit send, and then I would just keep hitting the refresh button to see if she sent me an email back, right? Like just insane things, insane ways of time you do that. Let me tell you what, what, what Moses is trying to get at here is this. When you take the love of God and the commandments of God and place them on your heart, they're your driving force. They're your directing force. They're the one that, that's what's going to make you do the crazy, insane things that Jesus freaks do. When you're radically committed to his advancement, his kingdom, his well-being. That's what he's getting at here. And then he goes a step farther, and this is where he starts talking to us as parents. And I'm going to go fast, I promise. He says this, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Now, this is why I love this, because he doesn't say, you shall be responsible for taking them to synagogue where there they will hear about Jesus or hear about God. You will be responsible for taking them to the ancient Hebraic form of Sunday school so that there they can hear about God and do those things, right? That's not what he says. What does he say? Parents, you do it. You do it. And here there's this great little truth. You ready for this? It is not my job as your pastor to disciple your children. It is not Connie's job as your children's ministry director to disciple your children. Nor is it Hunter's job as your student pastor to disciple your children. It is your job to disciple your children. You teach them about it. Let me tell you why I, I think sometimes the church doesn't necessarily help you in this process. In the late 60s and early 70s, <clears throat> we had something called the Jesus Movement that kind of swept through America. And out of that and some other... Um, things that occurred during that time, we began to see youth ministries kind of build up all over the country. If you were going to reach teenagers, you had to have a youth ministry, and these things kind of grew and, and grew and grew, and as we became more popular, churches all over the place began having youth ministries, and then we began hiring youth ministers, and then we began hiring children's ministers, and eventually became college ministry, because when all these kids that had gone through children's ministry and youth ministry got out of high school, they didn't know what to do with themselves or how to be adults, so we had to create another ministry just separate for them so that they could kind of continue moving forward, and then it becomes young adult singles ministry, and you understand where I'm going from that, and eventually we create all of these very specialized ministries. Right now in the United States, and all over the world for that matter, we have more books, about children and youth ministry. We have more paid children and youth ministers on staff. We have places where you can go and get a doctoral degree in children and youth ministry in a couple different places all over the country. And yet, in spite of all of the resources that we have and all the money we pour into children and youth ministry and all of everything that goes into what we do at the church with our program for children and youth ministry, in spite of all of that, 85% of your high schoolers, when they graduate from high school, will walk away from the church and not come back. 85% of them. I was talking to the parents upstairs today, and I asked them this question. I said, let's say we wanted to go on a plane ride. We're going to go on vacation to Hawaii. I'd like to go to Hawaii, right? And we get on the airplane, and the pilot comes up the intercom, and he's like, this is your pilot speaking. I'm happy to talk to you today. We're so excited about going to uh, Hawaii with you today, and uh, if you'll sit back and relax, then um, we promise that we will get you to Hawaii about 15% of the time, actually, maybe 20%. We will either get there, or we'll crash on the way, or play it somewhere else. So uh, listen, the stewardess will be through a little while with some peanuts, and uh, just sit back and relax. You get off the plane! You'd be like, no! 15% of the time, that's not good enough, right? We, we expect to get there all the time. Yet, yeah, watch, 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 yet. Yeah. We continue to send our children and students to children and youth ministries in churches that are largely failing. Why? Because somewhere along the line, parents thought, you know what? I'm not good enough. I'm not smart. I don't have a degree. You're specialized in this. You can deal with this. Look, I'm just going to bring them to you and let you disciple them. But can I be honest with you? 
no matter what we do in the church for our two hours a week that we get your kids, we cannot trump what goes on at home. And if you aren't teaching your children about Jesus, they may not get to their required destination. Amen. They may not. Now, it's the church's responsibility to come alongside you. It's the church's responsibility to come along and give you help, to give you resources, to empower you, to, to encourage you, right? To, to help reiterate to your children the same things that, that you're hearing or that they're hearing at, at home. But it is not our responsibility to decide for your children. It is yours. They're watching you. And they're going to become just like you. They see everything that you do. They see where your priorities are. They see what matters. And don't be surprised when the same things matter to them. I think about the things that we teach our kids. Good things, right? I think about the things we teach our kids. I think about we teach them to hit a curveball. We teach them how to do a pirouette, what the first position is, right? We, we teach them about how to do math and how to read. And, and these are wonderful and amazing things. Why, why, why do we stop there? Not tell them about the love of Jesus Christ that we claim has changed our lives. Moses is going to give us some examples. He's going to tell us this is how you should do it. Here are some things you can do. He says, I want you to talk about them, right? When you sit down at your house, when you uh, walk along the way, when you lie down, and when you get up. Basically, he says, hey, everywhere you go should be an opportunity for you to tell your children about Jesus Christ. The one that I struggle with the most here, just to kind of single one out, is when you're walking along the way. Now, I don't walk anywhere. I drive places, and so do you, so I'm just going to insert that in there. And I think about, oh, my goodness, what in the world am I teaching my children when I'm driving down the road? What music am I listening to? Is it God glorifying, or is it some glorifying something else? Right? And I tell you, I struggle with that, because I like music. And I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to secular music. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, hey, what do you primarily put into your children's head? What television shows do you allow them to watch or not to watch? Where do you allow them to go? What do you allow them to do? What do they hear out of your mouth when that person cuts you off in the car line at pickup? What do they hear from you? Watch, 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 because watch. They never miss a teachable moment. You may. They won't. Moses says, when you, when you lie down at night, make, make God be a part of your bedtime routine. When you get up in the morning, even those people that are not morning people like this guy right here, man, man, figure out some way to allow the love of God to show through your life into the hearts of these young children. We have got to use everything we have to share with them about God everywhere we go. It is our responsibility. And parents, I believe one day we'll stand accountable before God. As to how well we did this. He goes on and he tells us why. This is one reason I love Moses. He's a real practical guy. He's going to tell you why. Look at verse, uh, look at verse, uh, well, first of all, look at verse 9. It says, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Uh, verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They should be frontlets between your eyes. Some of the uh, Orthodox Jews took this very seriously. And that's where you see the phylacteries on their hands with the straps that go around. They have little bits of the law in there. What he's basically meaning is, is this needs to be a part of everything you do in everywhere you go. The word of God, the commandments of God, the law of God. In our case, the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be on the front of our minds and the, and the, and the tip of our tongue. Amen. He goes on. Verse 10. He says, And when the Lord, your God, brings you into the land that he swore to your father, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, and with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not build, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house. Slave. Let me, let me tell you what I love about this. See, when things go bad in our lives, when things go sour, when mom and dad get a divorce, right? In my case, that was something that was horrible. When you get sick, or when something doesn't go the way that you want it to go, or when the bank account dwindles too low, or when, when, when problems kind of abound, we're real quick at that point to run to God, right? We're real quick to get on our knees at that point and to pray to God. Thank you, God. Help me, God. Why is this happening, God? Why do we pray all those prayers? What Moses is getting out here is this. Look, I understand out here in the wilderness, you have a connection with God. Because guess what? He's feeding you. There's going to come a time where you're going to go into a land and things are going to be good. 
There's going to be a time when things aren't going to be hard or difficult. There's going to be a time where, where you're not going to have to have worked, but yet you're going to be reaping the benefits of the work. You, you, you track it with me? And he said, and if we don't take time, parents, to teach the commandments of, our, of God to our children now, then when things are good, they may forget about what he's done. They may forget about him. Because can I be honest, when things are good, when the bank account is full, Everybody's healthy. We're out on vacation. We don't think an awful lot about God during those times, do we? When things are good, it's easy to forget about the God that has provided for us and gotten us there. Moses is saying to us, as parents today, if we don't teach our children about God, then they're in danger of forgetting who He is. I've uh, done mission work for about six years now in the remote Andes Mountains of Ecuador. <clears throat> and uh, uh, up in there, we would go to some of these villages, uh, some villages where, where uh, no white man had ever been before until we showed up there. Um, it's kind of neat to watch uh, indigenous folks from the mountains of Ecuador see blonde-haired, blue-eyed girls um, because they've never seen that before, and it's, it's pretty neat. And we would go up there. There's no missionaries. There's, there's no churches. There's... Um, there's very little outside influence, and we would go up into these mountain villages. And on our very first trip up there, we began talking to some of the villagers and speaking with them. And our translators came to us at one point, and they said, the language they're speaking is a little bit weird. Um, it's Spanish, but they also, uh, up in here, they speak the indigenous language of Quechua. And so they're, they, they kind of mix the Quechua and the Spanish language, and it's difficult sometimes to understand what it is that we're saying. And so we did a little more research and began kind of discussing with them about the difference in language. And sure enough, we found out, yes, that, that the older ones spoke the Quechuan language, but the children uh, had no interest in learning the Quechuan language. So the children were much better at speaking Spanish uh, and wanted to learn English desperately, uh, where the, the adults spoke kind of broken Spanish and Quechuan, and, um, and ultimately they were very distraught, these parents were, because the children were not interested in learning Quechua. At first I was like, well, that's just progress, right? Like, this just move past that, maybe that language needs to die. And then I got to thinking, no, wait, 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 hang on. There's an entire culture that's going to be lost because these parents are content to sit by and not teach their children about the Quechuan language and the way of the Quechua that lived up here in these mountains. And it will be lost. And one of the things that just kind of dawned on me there about five or 6,000 feet above sea level in a very remote area of Ecuador was that they're just one generation away from Quechuan ceasing to exist as a language. There's just one generation of people going, no, not for me. And it will no longer exist. And no one will remember and no one will be able to speak it. Listen, church, we need to deal with the reality that we are one generation away from Christianity as a faith structure dying away. And if we don't teach our children about Jesus, they will forget. It's our responsibility. It's our job. We don't do it. No one will. Now, as parents, can I just tell you, it doesn't matter how old your kids are. Today, I want to ask you to respond, parents, by, by making that same commitment that these four families made today up here on the stage. I want you to make that commitment by saying, you know what, Jeremy? Today is the day. I'm going to draw a line in the sand, and I'm going to do everything I can to get the resources I need so that I can teach my children about Jesus, so that I can take primary responsibility for their discipleship and their spiritual growth, so that I can do what I have been designed by God to do. Jeremy, I'm going to start setting a godly example for them, and I'm starting it today. I'm making that commitment. I'm making that commitment fresh and anew to that. You only have a short period of time left. Make the most of the weeks that you have with your children. Maybe you're here today you're a grandparent. Maybe you're a grandparent raising a child. Maybe you're a grandparent that has great influence in your child's life. Can I ask you to do something as well? Will you also make that commitment and say, I know my grandbabies look at me and look up to me and listen to me and follow me. And I know that I need to take the time that I have with them, the little bit that I may get to spend with them. And I need to reiterate what mom and dad are telling them or not telling them at home. And if mom and dad aren't telling at home, then I'm going to start praying for mom and dad. But I'm going to just take the bull by the horns and go, you know what? I'm going to start telling you about Jesus. And I'm going to start teaching you the stories of the Bible. And I'm going to start teaching you the songs of Zion. 
so that ultimately you won't forget what it is that God has done on your behalf. Maybe you're here today and you don't have any kids. Can I ask you to do something if you don't have kids? Do you understand there are people all throughout our community, all over this world, who don't have godly parents, who are instilling values in them? They, they don't. Would you be willing to stand in the gap? Will you be willing to come and to volunteer in, in our Crosswind Kids and come volunteer in our Crosswind Student Ministry? Will you be willing to come and to hang out with kids at Six Flags? Will you come to recognize that whether you have children or not, our children are watching you? They're watching the way you act when you're out at the restaurant. They're watching the way you act when you're at Walmart. They're watching you. Will you be willing to say, I will set a godly example? For some of you, it may mean that you get to be surrogate grandparents. Can I just tell you something? <laughs> when we moved to Hayden uh, almost seven years ago, Jody was pregnant with Abby, and uh, Emma was, what, two and a half years old? And um, the, the chairman of the search committee, his name was Chester Thomas. And uh, Chester was an older gentleman. He had two uh, grandchildren of his own. And um, his wife, Sherry, um, uh, had been, they had been divorced and remarried and, and all kinds of situations in there. And their kids were grown and out of the way. And for whatever reason, Sherry and Chester decided they were just going to adopt our kids. And they did. And in the absence of Jody's mom, and in the absence of my parents, Sherry and Chester stood up, took the bull by the horns, and to this day, our children called them Mimi and Poppy and are planning week-long vacations to go see them during the summer. That's just the way that it works. And Mimi and Poppy set great examples for our daughters and taught them great things about Jesus. We're not related to them one bit, but they did it because God put that in their heart to come become surrogate grandparents. Maybe you're single today and you're sitting here mad that I spent the whole time talking about parents. Maybe you're frustrated because, like, oh, one, 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 husband, right? I don't want to give this. Yeah, right, baby? Listen, I want you to understand something. You are so vital to the lives of our children. Single individuals, I want you to understand something. You're teaching our children how to be single. You're teaching them how to be godly men and women. And they're watching you, and they look up to you probably even more than they do to us. When I was a little boy, about 10 or 11 years old, there was a young man in my church. He was in high school. He was driving age, so he was a junior, senior in high school. His name was Andre Brewer. And Andre, uh, during one summer, I don't know why he did this. I don't know if it was a program our youth ministry did or what. He just took it upon himself to invest in me. And he'd call me up, and he'd come out to my house because I couldn't drive. And I couldn't go anywhere. I lived out in the country, not near anybody, right? He would drive out, and we'd go gallivanting all over the farm. And we'd go up and down the creek, and we'd throw rocks probably at each other and things like that. But he was an individual that came and invested in my life. If you're single and not married, don't have kids, don't think this message isn't for you. Even more so, I want you to understand that God has placed you where you are so that you can fulfill a very unique role and invest in our children and invest in our teens and teach them how to live a godly life as a single. We need you. It takes all of us, lest we forget. In just a minute, we're going to sing one last song. And as we do, I just want to encourage you as parents, as families, Maybe right now is a moment where you need to come and just lay it down on the altar and say, okay, God, I'm drawing the line in the sand today. Maybe you need to go get your kid and you need to pray for them. Maybe you need to go walk across the room and find somebody else and say, let me pray with you and let me partner with you as you seek to raise your child as a grandparent, as you seek to raise your child as a single mom, as you seek to raise your child in a blended family. Let me come alongside you and reiterate those same truths of the Scripture lest we all forget what it is that God has done for us. Here, O crosswind, the Lord your God is one. God, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Teach these things diligently.